I'm Jim Schultz, and this is From Theory to Practice. Welcome to the show today. Welcome to the program. Welcome to the Tuesday edition of what it is that we are trying to do that feels a whole lot like a Monday edition of what it is that we are trying to do. So if you're watching the program over on Tasty Live, Forget about Tasty Live. Hop on over to YouTube. Join the discussion. Join the conversation. I see the questions. I see the comments coming in, and it's going to be a good time had by all for the next, you know, 40, 45 minutes or whatever. So what we're going to do is the first, you know, 5 to 10 to 12 to 17 minutes of the program, I'm going to work through, you know, some teachable moment that we've been able to concoct coming into the show. And then we'll turn to you know, as many questions from y'all as we can possibly get to. I usually average somewhere between 1 and three questions per show with very, very, very lengthy answers. So the earlier you can get your question in, the greater the delta, the greater the probability that we'll be able to get to it. So if you have a question for me, then definitely drop it in the chat box. And remember, another thing we started trying uh, last week that I feel like I've gotten some pretty decent feedback on is <clears throat> I recognize that I can't always get to all of the questions during the live stream. So what I've been doing is when the live stream is over, if there's one or two or three questions, and I'm like, hey, that's a really good question. I'd like to, you know, respond to that. I'll copy it and I'll put it over on my Twitter feed. I'm just at Jay Schultz F3. If you connect with me on Twitter, I will give the question. I will give my response. And so it may not be as valuable as kind of a live, you know, uh, you know, spontaneous uh, answer to that question. But hopefully it's a little bit of something. So let's go ahead. Oh, well, you guys are kind of getting situated. How about my Jaguars, man? You guys like my Jags? I've been a Jaguars fan since day one. And it's all about the Jags. And so let's go ahead. Let's talk about what are we going to do with low volatility, man? Like, what are we going to do? Like, there's nothing to do. Like, look at this market. This market is like, wow. I mean, the NASDAQ has been up. You know, the NASDAQ has been in a range of plus or minus 30 basically the whole day. Like, the entire day has just been plus or minus 30. You've got the VIX, you know, trading at. I mean, it's trading at 19 today. But that's after a 90-cent pop to the upside. So we were in the low 18s, you know, to open up the week to kind of start off this day. And so it doesn't feel like it felt at the beginning of last year, even the beginning of last year. I mean, things got off to a very, very bumpy start. And then the market never really recovered from that point, And the VIX remained elevated for most of the year, spending most of the year, I think, over 25, if not, you know, 28, 29, 30. And then, of course, a number of days over 30. So right now, with the VIX being lower, it's like, what are we going to do? There's nothing to do. It's like, yeah, I mean, this isn't the VIX at 9 or 10 like we saw in, you know, 2017, 2018. So at least it's not that. But still, it's not the VIX at 25. It's not the VIX at 27. It's not the VIX at 30. So what can we do in a low volatility environment? Well, I got you, boo. I got you a little low volatility strategy that we can go through today. And I would say, I'd say this is probably my favorite low volatility strategy. I would say this is my number one Tom Brady low volatility strategy, and you can start using this today immediately. I really, really like the way this sets up. So when volatility is high, like there's so many different things that we can do, right? We can sell premium. We can, you know, undefined risk, defined risk. We can do so many different things. Strangle, short puts, racial spreads, whatever. And I am actually of the mind that even selling premium in low volatility is still not a bad strategy. Don't tell Tom that I said that. But selling premium all the time pretty much works. It just works a lot better when volatility is higher. So if volatility is lower and we don't want to sell any premium, then what are we going to do? Well, you kind of have to buy some premium if you want to you know, engage in the marketplace. You're either selling premium or you're buying premium. There is no neutral premium option when it comes to your, you know, your option strategy. So when it comes to buying premium, what are we going to do? We're going to buy naked calls? Absolutely not. We're going to buy naked puts? Absolutely not. Here is the strategy that I like to use in low volatility environments. The old-fashioned, plain vanilla, cookie cutter, Betty Crocker, diagonal spread. And so a diagonal spread is a combination of a long vertical spread, which is another good low volatility environment strategy, and a long calendar spread, which is another good you know, low volatility, long premium strategy. The diagonal spread is effectively a combination of those two things. You're able to take you know, kind of the multiple expiration cycle angle of a calendar spread and also the directional angle of a vertical spread, and you smush them together, and you have a diagonal spread. And so I really like diagonal spreads in low volatility environments. So right now, <clears throat> that's what we're going to do. In the next couple of minutes, let's get a diagonal spread on. As you guys get situated, as you guys get ready for the show, 
Get your questions, get your comments. They're in the feed. I'm going to try to get to as many as I can. And don't forget, if I can't get to it live on the show, it may very well show up on my Twitter feed. So looking at the, you know, looking at the Tasty Default watch list, which is, you know, it's one of my go-to watch lists. I like the Tasty Default watch list. I like Tom's watch list. Those are my two kind of primary go-to watch lists when it comes to trying to find things to do, trying to find stocks to trade and trying to find, you know, opportunities for trade entry. Well, one of the things I'm going to do right now is <clears throat> let me sort, let me sort this by earnings from, you know, earliest to latest from soonest to not so soonest. And so you'll see if we look right here at the, uh, you know, the earnings dates, we've got if Goldman Sachs was this morning. Wow. They really took a, took a pounding a little gorilla smackage on, uh, you know, on Goldman Sachs, like right there, you see right there. This says, you know, GS, which apparently stands for Goldman Sachs, but I don't think so, man. I think that stands for Gorilla Smacked. And so, ouch, man, down $26. That is not good. That is not good at all. But Goldman Sachs is over and done with Gorilla Smackage aside. Netflix coming on down the shoes on Thursday. Then next week, we've got, you know, the heavy hitters. Got your IBMs, got your Microsofts. Got your Teslas, got your Snapchats. I still can't believe they're in business. Then the following week, so to kick off February, uh, we've got Meta, we've got Apple, we've got Google, we've got Amazon, we've got a little Chipotle action, got a little Starbucks action, a little Disney coming on down the chutes. And so it's going to be a lot of fun. So the reason why I bring this up is not only to get excited about what's coming down the chutes, but also I don't really want to mix it up with too many individual stocks right now because I don't like to trade stocks that have earnings coming up in like a week or two weeks. Or like 17 days or just something kind of weird that's like right out there in the middle of the expiration cycle. I feel like you're making an already difficult endeavor that much more difficult because, you know, the implied volatility that's most likely going to get bid up going into that event is going to be working against your positive theta. Because remember, when we sell premium, we're short vega. So when I sell premium and I'm short vega, I'm short volatility. So if I sell premium and I'm short Vega and I'm short volatility, I want volatility to go down. I don't want volatility to go up. Well, going into these events, like an earnings event uh, that all these stocks have, and you see that you know a number of them coming up in the next couple of weeks, that volatility increase that's very likely going to happen going into the earnings event as traders all position themselves by buying options and trying to bank on a, a, you know, a, a big direction to move in their favor, that's going to work against us as premium sellers. So to me, you know, right now we're kind of in this weird spot where it's like, all right, it's going to be hard to find good opportunities with, you know, an individual stock. So we may have to turn to some index as well because volatility is on the lower end. You know, I've got the VIX at 19. That can even be difficult. So right now it's like, okay, I probably don't want to do too many individual stocks for the reasons I just brought up. And, you know, indexes are even hard because the, you know, IV ranks and implied volatilities are on the lower end. So what can we do? Well, this is where you might turn to an index still but use one of these low implied volatility, uh, low implied volatility strategies, uh, like a diagonal spread. You could do a vertical spread; that'd be a great choice. You could do a calendar spread; that would also be a great choice. But I like the diagonal spread kind of as my uh, as my go-to. So that's uh, so that's that when it comes to earnings. So what I want to do here, <clears throat> I was scouting this out a little bit earlier, and I saw XLE. So you can see right here; it's 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 already on the screen right now. We don't even have to move away or navigate away from this screen xle this is an index this is you know uh, an energy one of the en energy little you know spider etfs or spider you know diversified baskets or whatever it is it doesn't matter it's energy <laughs> i should probably know more than i actually know but i'm like all right it says energy it says spider then you know it's got my you know it's got my stamp of approval in my opinion so this is going to be an etf Type of instrument. It's not going to be an individual stock. It's not quite the ETF that like an SPY or a QQQ is going to be, but this is going to be some diversified basket of, you know, of energy entities. Well, if you look at the implied volatility rank, you can see at 7.4. And so that's on the lower end for sure. We've got, you know, single digits on the IV rank. So it's like, all right, let me step in here. Let me see if we can set up a little diagonal spread. Let me clear that away so that y'all can't see what I was working on. So it'll, so I can pretend like we're going to do this spontaneously in the moment. So what I want to do is I want to set up a February, March diagonal spread. And I want to play this thing to the downside because I do have a little bit of a bearish tint on the market right now, even though I am still, you know, a longstanding member of the International Permables club and society i am playing the market to the downside for the very very short term like the next you know couple of months maybe the first half of the year i mean we'll just kind of see 
you know how the uh, how things shake out but i do want to position my portfolio a little bit to the downside so what i'm going to do is i'm going to go into march and the basic idea behind a diagonal spread is you buy an option that's a little bit in the money in the back month so in this case that would be march and then you sell an option that's a little bit out of the money in the front month so in this case that would be february so i'm going to buy an option in march i'm going to sell an option in february and i'm going to create some distance between the strikes much like I would with a vertical spread. So since I want to play this to the downside, I'm going to be using put options. If you wanted to play this to the upside, then you would be using call options, but you'd effectively follow kind of the same process. You buy a strike, a couple strikes in the money, and then you sell the strike, a couple strikes out of the money. And there are certain parameters that you're looking for in terms of the price of the strategy, and I'll talk about that as we kind of set this guy up in the next uh, the next couple of minutes. So if I go to March here with XLE, the first thing that you might notice is, you know, you've got the stock in 90, you know, XLE's got some $5 wide strikes in the March cycle. So that's going to work against, you know, any flexibility and, you know, having a lot of, you know, customization available to me, at least in the March cycle. Now, the February cycle might be a different story. And based on my looking at this before the show, I know that it is a different story. So that's going to be very, very nice. But right here, it's probably still going to be doable because I can just step in here. I clear away those drawings. And why are we using yellow? I mean, this is a synthetic magenta Monday. So let's get our let's get our head in the game here. So, you know, not unlike Tom Brady last night, I said was certainly not in that game. But if I buy this 95 put, this can be my in-the-money option for the back month cycle that in this case, of course, again is going to be March. So now what I do, let me clear away that let me clear let me let me remember how to talk and then let me clear away that box. Let me let me minimize March. Let's go into February. And now you can see that February has a lot more flexibility in terms of the strike availability. So now I've got dollar point wide strikes. I've got a lot more maneuverability in terms of the premium that I want to sell. So I want to go a couple strikes out of the money. So right here, you can see that XLE is at 90. And so I don't know, maybe I sell, maybe I sell like an 88. So maybe I sell like an 88 striked put. And this sets up really, really well. It's almost like this was on the screen a couple seconds ago because I was looking at this before the show. It's almost like I prepared this strategy for you all so I knew that our time would be most efficiently used. It's almost like that. If you look at this strategy, we buy the 95, we sell the 88. We buy the 95 in March, we sell the 88 in February. Now, how do we make money? Well, we need XLE to go down. We effectively want that, that short put that we sold right here, this 88 put. We want this guy to go in the money. We want the market to push beyond that point. We want the whole we want the whole spread to be in the money. Now, right now, the 95 put is already in the money, but we want the 88 put to go in the money too. We effectively have a bearish bias. This is a bearish play. We want to go ahead and have the market move lower. If that happens, then the you know the, the diagonal spread is going to be filling up with value over time. It's going to be reaching its maximum value, which you know you can you can see here that. If I look at like my max profit and my max loss figures, I've talked about this before. I think the, you know, the developers could really, it could be a little bit of an improvement if instead of having zero here, they had like an NA or just like a dash or maybe even a question mark asterisk. There's so many other things we could use here outside of a zero because the max profit is not zero. The max loss is also not zero. Unknown would be a better label for these metrics but one thing that we do know is that we can actually approximate the max loss and max gain uh, levels for a diagonal spread pretty well the maximum gain is usually going to be the distance between the spread width and what we pay for it so in this case you can see i'm paying 450 for a seven dollar wide spread so the most i could make on this strategy is two dollars and fifty cents or 250 dollars per one loss. So I'd be looking to manage just at 50% of max profit, like I do a lot of other strategies that we utilize here at Tasty. And so that's going to be my maximum profit, approximately. The maximum loss is usually the debit that you pay. It's usually going to be this $4.50 debit that I pay. Now, remember, though, one final comment before we put this on, and then I want to get to y'all's questions, as many of them as we can. Remember that this is a diagonal spread. So we have multiple expirations between you know the two strikes between the two legs of the strategy. So what does that mean? Well, it means a couple of different things. But one of the things that it means is when that front month expires, so when February expires, if I haven't hit my profit target, if I'm still holding the trade or whatever, I can get rid of that short option 
that is in that front month that is in that February cycle. One that once that thing expires, you know, in the money, at the money, uh, out of the money, whatever, I have more opportunities to keep selling premium against this four dollars and fifty cents. So I could go into some weekly options between, you know, February and March. I could go all the way into March to kind of match those guys both up in the same cycle. There's a lot of different things that I could do with the strategy. And if you follow the show on a regular basis, you know, one of the things I I try have tried to do for the last however many years and i will continue to try to do even with this new format of the show i'm still kind of figuring out how everything kind of fits i want you guys to be able to follow all the positions in my portfolio day to day like i'm not going to be managing these off the show i'm not going to be managing these off air so if something if something needs to be done i'm going to do it live you know on the show and now that we're doing it live on youtube y'all control me y'all can heckle me like it's gonna be a good time had by all i can assure you of that so i don't know i like it I think it sets up reasonably well. You know, the cost of the diagonal, we usually like to pay about 75% the width of the spread or less. And so $4.50 on a $7 wide spread, you know, that's like what, 60% or 63% or something like that. And so this is pretty good in terms of the cost of the overall spread. And so I like it. I'm going to go ahead and ship this guy. And then, uh, you know, we're 15 minutes into the show, 16 minutes into the show. I think it's time, man. I think it's time to get to some questions. So let me go ahead. And let me just go up to like 461, just so we can go ahead and get this guy filled. All right, so we're filled at 461. There you go. That's some good stuff. So now what I want to do, let's get to some questions, man. Let's get to y'all who are hanging out with me on a Tuesday afternoon. I appreciate you guys. Go Jag. So Day, so Day says, should I call for a sign early at 110, expiring in February 10th? Extrinsic value three dollars. Uh, call for a sign. So uh, I can't I can't gather from your question there, Day, if you're long or short the option. So I'll, I'll answer it from both standpoints. If you're if you're long the option, then you have the you have the option or opportunity to uh, exercise the option, which would be assigning the shares to the short side of the option. Now, should you do that? Uh, probably not. Not if there's that much extrinsic value left in the left in the options. Now, you said the extrinsic value is three dollars, and so is that three actual dollars, like three cents? So three dollars per contract, or is that three option dollars? So actually, three hundred actual dollars uh, per contract. So obviously, that's going to be very, very different. But just understand that if you choose to go forward with the exercise and the assignment, you know, you said you have a call option, so you would effectively be buying the shares at the strike price if you were the long side of the contract. You're going to lose out on that extrinsic value. Right. If you if instead you wanted to capitalize on your option, you like the profitability, you like the profit point right now, then just sell the option. If you sell the option, you get all the intrinsic value and you get the extrinsic value. If you exercise the option, you only get intrinsic value. And so keep that in mind. Now, a lot of times people will exercise options for dividends and reasons like that, where they want to start building a long term position. And that might be the situation that you're in. But from the long side, that's kind of how you want to think about this from the short side. You kind of never really want you know to force assignment. That's never really going to be a desirable situation for you, not to mention you don't even have a choice to assign the option. That choice, that uh, alternative or that option always rests with the long side of the contract. So if I'm short a call option, I don't have the choice to assign the contract. It's just simply not something that I can do. That's going to be an option that rests with the long side of the contract. So if you're long, there's a couple of different things you can consider. If you're short, you don't really have an, uh, an option to assign the contract to yourself, the long side would effectively have to do that. So, so John says, Hey, Dr. Jim, low implied volatility strategies. That's what I need. Thanks. Well, I'll tell you what, John, ma'am, I did a great, so I did a great little YouTube live with a group of Brazilian traders uh, last night. It was amazing. It was absolutely incredible. And so I love the people in Brazil, man. I love Brazilian people. They're just always so warm and so friendly and so respectful. And they have great questions and great traders, man. Some absolutely phenomenal traders, just great questions, like really thoughtful, thoughtful questions. Like, man, this is awesome. And so we were talking about low implied, vol uh, low implied volatility strategies last night. And, you know, one of the questions that I received was, hey, you know, what are my favorite strategies? Like, how would I approach, you know, learning the different strategies in the market? And I'll tell you what, John and everybody else that happens to be watching right now, I think you're far better off, far better off learning four or five or maybe six strategies 
and mastering those as opposed to trying to know every strategy and be reasonably proficient at every strategy. That's a very, very difficult task. That's an extremely overwhelming task, especially if you're brand new and you're just kind of making your way. You're just trying to you know, put the pieces together. I think you can do yourself just a real, real solid if you kind of pare down the number of strategies you go for and just go for four or five or six. And so when it comes to low volatility, diagonal spreads, Long vertical spreads and long calendar spreads would be my go-to options for you know uh, high volatility and short premium. I like short puts, short strangles, and put ratio spreads. So that would be my list. If you all kind of want to just copy that and use it for your own your own devices. So Harold says, Doctor Jim, it's your boy, man. Harold, what's going on? He says, I'm late. Anywho, I got the perfect trade for this segment. You all may even join in yourself. Nike diagonal. I like it, Harold. March one thirty put. February 120 put and Harold some, some shooter McGavin stuff man going with this uh these ten dollar wide diagonal spreads let's give it a look so does Nike have earnings coming up soon uh apparently not I think they just recently had earnings maybe so if I buy a March 130 put and then I go into February and I sell what do you say a 120 put I do a 120 put I'll tell you what I'll tell you what Harold this is a pretty good looking. This is a pretty good looking trade. In fact, it's so good looking. I might even join you on this trade, man. I don't have you taken me down yet? I think so. Just from a probabilistic standpoint alone, but I can't remember it. I can't pick out the trade specifically, so I'm not sure. So this could be your opportunity. This could be your first opportunity to take me down in 2023. And so I like it, man. I mean, we're paying way less than 75% the width of the spread. We're paying like 50% the width of the spread. And remember, you know, the debit that you pay is your maximum loss point, or at least a very good approximation of your maximum loss point. So, uh, you know, this kind of fits pretty well with position sizing for my account. I typically like to stay between 1% and 3% in terms of defined risk strategies and with twenty thousand dollars this is right around two percent a little bit more than two percent so uh we can definitely uh make this make this guy work i like it harold i like it a lot let me go in i'm gonna go in at like 480 just so i get filled really quick and i can get back to the questions but i like that harold that's good stuff man so we got the nike diagonal on too so we have two diagonals on now in xle and uh nke so again if you follow the show on a regular basis you will see me manage these over the course of the next couple of days couple of weeks, couple of months, you know, a couple of cycles, you know, whatever it takes to get where we are trying to go. So thank you, Harold. That's uh, that's really good. So Max Wheel says exactly thanks. I imagine you're referring to the title of the segment. So I hope this is helpful. I really do. I, mean, I, I want to give you guys, you know, content that is valuable and timely and things you can use right away. And so when I think about the different segments for the show, I don't really want to just talk about some stuff that I don't think is going to be applicable to you guys and helpful for you guys, you know, in the moment. And so, so KZ says... Does Tastyworks keep track? Does Tastyworks keep track of your cost basis when you roll? I've been rolling a broken wing butterfly for a credit. When I go to close the position, does Tastyworks give my PL with all the credits rolled in? And so then if I if you go down a little bit, I see I see Larry kind of lurking there with the answer, and he is 100 percent correct. He says, check the options tab, check the options chain tab on the right side of the desktop application. That is correct. KZ, thank you very much there, Larry. Let me show you how to do that, though. So if I go into, you know, the problem is I don't have any, I haven't adjusted any of these positions because they're somewhat new. And I put these on, you know, kind of at the end of last year to kind of clean things up going into uh, going into 2023. So unfortunately, I don't have any adjustments that uh, have already been made on any different uh, on any different positions. But uh, actually, wait a minute. Look at UNG. Yeah, we're getting we're getting a little hammered on UNG. So uh, I think. Well, here, here's what we'll do. Let's adjust this strategy together, and that way you can see how to use the options chain correctly. And, and it's very simple. I mean, it's very, very easy to do, but if you don't know what you're looking for, you don't know where to look, then, of course, it can be very, very confusing. And so all I'm going to do, so you can see I've been tested on the put side. You know, I can go into the option chain right here. I can go into February, and then you see, you know, you've got my, or I guess I've got my, uh, 21 call right here. You can see there's nothing left in that option. It's three cents, five cents. You know, there's just no premium left. I could roll that guy down in that direction, but I mean, take a look at some of these premiums down here, right? I mean, there's that, there's nothing there. Like there's really like nothing there. So I'm like, ah, do I really want to give up all that real estate between the shorts in exchange for you know 20 cents or 18 cents or 26 cents or whatever? Maybe because we're only talking about an $11 stock. 
And so we also have to make sure that we contextualize this correctly and that I can't be expecting, you know, a dollar, two dollars, three dollars in terms of the extrinsic value differentials when I roll up or roll down or roll the untested side in, that's not going to be a, a reasonable expectation for a stock that's only selling for $11. So rolling in, I guess it could work. I mean, if I rolled in from, you know, the 21 to the 14, I would I would add like 40 cents to the trade, but then I would be left with a 12, 14, a 12, 14 strangle, which I don't know, that's okay. Maybe we'll come back to that. So hold on, let's, let's put that on the shelf. Let's instead consider... Ah, this is kind of interesting. So take a look at this. You've got the February options, right? You can see I'm in February. But look, there's no March. There's no March monthly cycle. I have to go all the way out to April, which is weird. I mean, UNG, we're not talking about, you know, some stock nobody's ever heard of. Like, we're talking about natural gas. We're talking about something like a lot of, you know, the world uses on like a daily basis. So we're not talking about like Ethereum. Or like, you know, some crap coin that people are just trying to, you know, scalp and trade and, you know, all the crypto bros, you know, have their finger on like, no, like we're talking about natural gas. That's pretty crazy. But anyway, let's see what happens if I just roll this thing out to April. So maybe I don't roll my intensive side at all. Maybe my adjustment protocol is just to add duration to the trade. If I roll this guy all the way out to April, man, I don't know. That's pretty good. I can roll this thing all the way out to April. And I can pick up 84 cents. Now, I don't know what I collected on entry. We'll take a look at that here in a second, KZ, as we look at the option chains and do exactly what Larry said. And we kind of, you know, we learn together how to utilize that. But I kind of like that. That's a pretty good looking guinea, in, in, in my opinion. It allows me to maintain the, the distance between the short so I don't give up any of that real estate. Some of you may argue that, you know, having a nine point wide spread in terms of my short strikes is too wide. I don't need it to be that wide. And that would be fair. So you could also roll that 21 down a little bit if you want to. But I kind of like having, you know, all that real estate, having a couple of acres between the two short strikes. So that's pretty nice. That's pretty valuable stuff. And so I like that. That's a pretty big gimme. Where's the gotcha? Well, the gotcha here is I don't really love the idea of being in April. Like, I don't really love the idea of, you know, getting into, you know, a leap option, basically 94 days away. I mean, that's a long, long time away. I mean, wow, that's crazy. April expiration. So my daughter, Penelope, just turned eight. To give you got the first tangent of the show. We're like halfway done. We're more than halfway done. So I'll do better tomorrow, I promise. My daughter, Penelope, just turned eight last week. My other daughter, Amelia May, the intern, the assistant for the show, she's going to be three on March 9th. And then my son, uh, Eli, is going to be six on April 6th. And so we're going to we're going to go through all the birthdays, all the all the kids birthdays and my birthday is in May and my wife's birthday is in June. And so uh, we're going to we're going to churn through all the birthdays before this UNG strangle comes to expiration. But I like it. Let's go ahead and do it. And then we can get to the uh, we can actually get to the, the the point of all this, which is the option chain. So let me go ahead and let's do uh, eh, let's just do like 77. That's fine. We'll see if we get improved. Uh, all right, so we got improved, so that's good. All right, so we got 77, we got improved, and I think I lost YouTube there for a second. Oh, we're back. Okay, good. And so uh, I don't know if did Autumn pay the internet bill today. She may not have paid the internet bill today, so this thing may this thing may die on us uh, any second. But hopefully, we can leg it out for another 15 minutes. So now I've got UNG up. So what I do is I just click on this right arrow up here, and if I go down to this little, you know, this little like chain looking thing. And then I go over to the order chains. If I click on that, what's going to happen is this is going to show me, you know, where I'm at on the trade. And it's going to take into account all the trades that I have made in this position. Like it goes ahead and, you know, uh, it, it amalgamates. It's probably not, probably not the best use of the word amalgamates. It, it concentrates. Right, it, it combines all of the different things that I've done in this trade, and so you can see right now, you know, I am down my average trade price. Let's see. So I don't really want the I want the total the total P and L. So you can see right here that we are. Let's see here. If I go back sixty days, maybe. Let's see here. No, I don't want sixty days. Let's see thirty days. UNG. Yeah, that's weird. Calendar spread on UNG. No. So for some reason, it's bringing up like nine different chains. And I don't really know why it's bringing up like nine different chains. So hold on a second. Bear with me as we're live on the show. And it should only be UNG. Huh, interesting. 
So normally, like you can see I have UNG populated, right? You can see I have it up here. You can see I have it up here. I mean, are my eyes playing tricks on me? Like that says UNG. Like I'm pretty sure that says UNG. All right. Well, all of this, you know, all of this right here, like everything up here, this should not be including, you know, the things down here. And so this is actually going to be a really, really good exercise for us because sometimes, right, technology fails us. Like some, I mean, technology is a beautiful thing when it works, right? Technology is an amazing thing when it all delivers on what it should deliver on. So if you are ever in a situation where the platform is kind of giving you some weird numbers, you know, the platform is kind of giving you some, looks a little bit janky. Here's all you got to do. It's very, very simple. Just go into, you know, forget about the order change. We're going to do like the 2000. 18 version of this like the caveman style version of this just go to the activity tab go to your symbol filter do ung and now all i need to do is let's see here let's go back 60 days on ung and here you go i see the two trades that are part of this package and now all i need to do is i just need to do some real quick Back of the envelope math, just some super, super quick math to figure out what my total basis is on this trade. And, and since it's only two numbers, it's going to be fairly straightforward to figure out. So all I need to do is 77 cents plus $1.62. That brings me to $2.39. So KZ, if you bring up the order chains, and it looks a little weird because sometimes, I mean, obviously, you know, technology everywhere, you know, glitches from time to time. Technology, I mean, I just lost YouTube for like 30 seconds. So we got Tastyworks, we got YouTube, we got all these things. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's just in my studio. I don't know. Maybe you're not having these issues wherever you might be. But you always have kind of a, you know, a, a check and balance. You always have kind of a secondary thing that you can go to to say, all right, that didn't really make sense. I wasn't comfortable with, you know, that information. Let me check this from a different angle. And the activity tab will never let you down. Like Rick Roll, it will never let you down. It will not never let you go. And so if you look at the activity tab, then you'll be perfectly fine in terms of figuring out what your basis is on the trade. And then understanding this, it's like, okay, I've collected 239. If I buy it back for a dollar twenty, that's a 50% gain. If I buy it back for 239, that's a scratch, and so on and so forth. And so you can kind of go from that point forward and uh and kind of figure out whatever you want to do from there. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Very, very good question, and uh, hopefully that helps. So Doc Options Trader, Doc, in the house, another one of my Brazilian peeps. Doc, man, I appreciate you. Hey, Jim, what do you think about a zebra on the call side on SQQQ? Looks like a good bearish bet if the market respects the LTB on QQQ. LTB. LTB, long-term, I don't know. LTB, SQQQ. Is that one of the leverage guys? I think it is. So this is going to be, so this is one of the ultra pro shorts. And so I don't know if that's 2X or 3X, but it's going to be some amount of leverage. So I typically don't mess with the leveraged funds because I really don't like, you know, the, the daily reset. So I really don't like having to get mixed up with the daily reset and having to get mixed up with, you know, kind of the, the, the fact that these funds can just slowly, you know, trickle down lower over time. And then, you know, the next thing you know, the stock hasn't moved, but you're down a bunch of money on the position because the daily reset's been working against you, you know, from the very beginning. And so if you actually look at, I did a segment with Tom and Tony on this recently, like within the last three to four months, I would just Google Tasty Live, uh, Skinny on Options, Abstract Applications, the Leverage Trap. I talked about how this can kind of be a trap in terms of the leverage on the position. And so unfortunately, Doc, I love you, man, because you're in Brazil. And I love you because you're my friend. But I'm going to pass on the SQQQ uh trade because uh yeah, I don't like I don't like falling into that leverage, that leverage trap. So uh so all right, so let's see. Uh Larry and KZ, you guys got to figure it out even before we did all that. So that's good. Uh Farm D Eric says, Hey Dr. Jim sitting on 95% cash. Are you also struggling to find seemingly lucrative tra trades in a comparatively lower implied volatility environment? I am. I am for all the reasons we kind of talked about in the introduction here to the program this afternoon. Yes, I'm right there with you. It can be a bit more challenging when volatility is lower, you know, because we as premium sellers do so much better when volatility is higher and we're able to take advantage of, you know, volatility's overstatement. We're able to take advantage of, you know, volatility, you know, contracting, you know, and generally speaking over time, like some of those contractions after you have an expansion can be very significant. And we can hop in right before the contraction takes hold of the market and we can ride that thing to a, you know, a profitable position, you know, over and over 
over and over again when it comes to trading in high volatility environments. So, uh, yes, it is more challenging right now, but uh, but there are things you can do. I mean, diagonal spreads, vertical spreads, calendar spreads, and even selling a little bit of premium. Right? Don't tell Tom I said this. Just tell him just some random guy on the internet was talking about this. Sell a little bit of premium in low volatility. I don't know. It's just an idea, right? It's just a thought. Right, we're just friends. This is a very informal, unofficial conversation. Right, nobody's inking on the bottom line. It's something to think about, man. I don't know. So Juan De La Cruz Martinez says, "Hey, Doctor Jim, at what IVR do you close your strangle if the IVR is dropped, but you still have thirty plus days to uh, days to expiration?" It's a great question, there, Juan. And I actually don't look at IVR in the middle of a trade. I really never have looked at IVR in the middle of a trade. Now, I know that some of the other hosts at Tasty Trade, they like to use IVR as one of their adjustment metrics. Like they're watching, you know, they're paying attention to the IVR on the stock. You know, they're looking at, you know, the IVR changes. And what's really cool too about, you know, inside of Tastyworks is if I go to like, you know, SPY and then I do dot IVR, you know, it actually brings up a chart of the IVR of SPY. And so I can actually look at, you know, how IVR itself has been doing. So even if you haven't been monitoring this every day and like putting it in your trade journal or whatever, you can just look at the chart of IVR and you can see for yourself if it's been, you know, moving higher, if it's been moving lower, you know, whatever. I mean, if volatility has been moving lower and IVR itself is collapsing, then that could be, you know, a supporting point that could begin to make the case for closing out the position. I don't like to do that simply because I find that using IVR on trade entry, possibly on trade exit, is more than enough in terms of giving me you know, a strategic advantage for what I'm trying to accomplish. And then in the middle, I'm looking at things like P&L, I'm looking at things like extrinsic value, I'm looking at things like stock price in relationship to the strike price, I'm looking at things like that. I find those to be a little bit more uh, helpful in terms of making adjustments on a daily basis. And I mean, sure, I mean, the, the textbook answer, you know, the official, you know, robotic, you know, political response here would be, of course, I look at IVR, I look at everything, you know, when it comes to making adjustments. But that's just not how I trade, and I don't think anybody trades like that. Like we all have our handful of things that we look at and we like looking at X, Y, Z. And it's like, sure, if I had unlimited resources in terms of time and ability and, you know, uh, just whatever, I would look at A, B, C, D, E, F as well. But generally speaking, we have a few things that we look at and IVR is not one of them there, Juan. So I don't really have a, you know, an answer to your question in terms of, you know, what am I looking at or what am I looking for to determine it's time to close a position because IVR has uh, has changed. But I would reach out to Tom, reach out to Tom or Tony or even like Mike or Nick or Katie. Uh, they may use those things in their adjustment metrics. And so they may be able to give you uh, a little bit more insight there. And so Farm D ask and I shall receive. Uh, Farm D says Tom Brady's strategy doesn't look good today. I agree, man. I mean, I didn't I didn't watch the game last night because we don't have cable. And but I, I've shared this before, but my neighbor across the street, my man has people over for like every sporting event ever. He's a great guy. He's probably in his uh, early 50s. Great guy. And we, we know we've chatted many, many times. Well, he has a huge TV, huge TV in his garage. And it's actually facing like my driveway. So sometimes I'll just pull a chair out of my driveway. Like if he's got a bunch of people over and whatever, I've, I've watched, you know, a number of games over there with him. But if he just gets, you know, if he's got a, a huge crowd over there already and I kind of want to like, you know, just kind of lurk in secrecy, I'll just sit in my own driveway and watch a game. I'll just sit in my own driveway and then watch a couple of plays. So I was able to do that last night, but I didn't really see the game because, you know, I got kids, I got wives, got all that kind of stuff. But uh, it did not look good, man. It did not look good in the few updates that I caught. It didn't look like a, uh, you know, a, a typical Tom Brady outing. So what is he going to do next? I don't know. I kind of don't really care, but um, it'll still be interesting. Interesting to see. So YT Gawker says, congrats to solving the inflation puzzle. Man, you're welcome. I didn't know I solved it. I didn't even know I was trying to solve it. But I appreciate you, man. I appreciate you a lot. So let's see. Uh, Neuro... Neuroside Doc says, anyone have an opinion about FUL? I kind of like it for the road tar adhesives infrastructure spending, but we'll listen to earnings. It seems like it could uh it could be good much lower. FUL. Oh, HB Fuller. So FUL. Let's take a look at this. Uh okay, so there's no weekly options. We've only got monthly options. We don't even have March. March is we don't even have April. Like FUL, you got January, you got February, but then you got to go right up. Wow, May 19th. How about that? May 19th. 
So do you all know whose birthday is on May 19th? Our very own Beth's birthday is on May 19th. The producer, the producer of Tasty Live, her birthday is on May 19th. And I am very, very proud and honored to say that I share a birthday with somebody famous because I have the same birthday. So I share a birthday with our very own Beth on May 19th. That's crazy that that ends up being an expiration Friday. So that's going to be a good time had by all. But anyway, FUL. So my, I have a sneaking suspicion here that the liquidity, it's going to be pretty craptacular. But let's take a look at it. Uh, ooh, yeah. Overall liquidity uh, or overview of the equity, one star. So that's not good. Uh, not looking good at all. If I go into the markets, so I'm probably not interested uh, here. Uh, let's see. That was uh, Neurosci. Um, but I mean, let's go ahead and take a look at it. If I go into February, uh, you can see, oh, yeah. And so if you look at the if you look at these options, right, you've got the stock at 7284. If I look at like the at the money, the at the or slightly out of the money put, you can see the spread between the bid and the ask on that on that out of the money put is like two dollars. And that's two option dollars. So that's like 200 actual dollars. And then if you go into, you know, the out of the money call, it's a little over two dollars. And so the problem here, their neuroci is, you know, liquidity is like the number one thing that we look for when it comes to trading options. Because, you know, a lot of times, you know, we're managing trades at 50% of max profit. Like, you know, we're not looking for huge winners when we do have winners on our hands. And so we don't want to get just completely chewed to pieces when it comes to the bid ask spread differential. And so we would much prefer to trade, you know, SPY, QQQ, IBM, Netflix, you know, stocks like that, where the bid ask spread differential is oftentimes, you know, one cent, two cents, three cents, whatever. And so we can get in and out pretty seamlessly without a whole lot of damage done in terms of giving away profitability or causing our losses to be even greater. And so from an option standpoint, this is probably not something that I would look to, to mix it up with. Now, from a pure stock standpoint, like if you like the stock, you know, you said you're going to kind of listen to the earnings call, then sure. I mean, you can see the, the bid ask spread on the actual shares is a lot more reasonable only at five or six cents. And so um, not something I'm going to look at here but uh, but thanks for bringing it up. I do appreciate that. I'd never heard of FUL, um, to be to be frank. So Clayton says, I'm seeing more skew with higher call extrinsic value and thinking time to switch to covered calls. You know, Clayton, I actually saw that recently, and I think I saw it in like SPY. So let me look at this really quick. Let me go to March. We only have a minute or so to go on the show. Well, let's just look at this just really, really fast. So if I do like, uh, uh, let's see here. Can I get them both on the screen? I can. So... Just take a look at, you know, if I look at a 41 delta put, and then I look at a 41 delta call, well, they mu they may they must have flipped over. So right here, you can see that I'm looking at, well, it's it's kind of tricky because now that's the 40 delta. But anyway, we look at a 393 put, the extrinsic value is 8, 876. We look at a 407 call, the extrinsic value is only 838. I was trying to match the deltas. You can see the delta here is 41. The delta here is now 40. And so I thought it was 41. And so it could be, you know, this one could be the better option, but it's pretty close. There's not a ton of differential between the two extrinsic values, but I'm right there with you, Clayton. So whether it was SPY or QQQ or even some individual stocks, I actually also saw the same thing. I saw a lot of volatility skewed to the upside in the marketplace where the extrinsic values on the calls were actually greater than equidistant put. So it's kind of like what I try to set up here, even though for this spe uh, specific example, it looks like the extrinsic value might, might even be a bit larger on the put side. So um, yes, I'm seeing the same thing. I'm seeing the same thing that you are uh, that you are seeing, but man, it looks like I'm out of time. So if you had a question, I'm gonna I'm gonna scroll down lower into the uh, into the feed. If there's a question or two down there that I wasn't able to get to, check my Twitter feed. I'm at Jay Schultz F3. I'll try to answer that question on my Twitter feed later today. So it'll be in the next couple of hours. And don't forget, guys, you can always email me too. I'm just Jay Schultz at tastytrade.com. But stay tuned. We do have Jamal coming up next with engineering the trade. In the meantime, guys, trade them small, trade them heavy, and stay generous. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Plenty in the buy and buy.